Mick, it's Dennis from the Australian Rock Show. How are you? Hi. Mate, obviously 2020 has been a challenging year with the pandemic, but one definite highlight has been the recent release of the Lime Spiders album titled LSD, Lime Spiders Delirium. It's been some time since there was any release from the band. Must be exciting to have some new product out. And what can you tell us about this uh, this coloured vinyl collection of rarities? It is exciting to start with it. It's very exciting after 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 sitting on these songs for so long. These are tracks that stretch back as far as well, the rest of the last track on the album's actually recorded in um, '93. So um, there are a bunch of demos. And some some were some were actually album tracks that didn't quite make the cut. They were like so. There's a big variety of um, quality in the um, in the masters, uh, ranging from little dat tapes to stuff that was mixed in America for the last album for Beethoven's Fist. Two tracks that didn't make the album. And so I guess the biggest challenge for Glenn Armstrong, the um, guy that compiled it, and um, and um, you know, mastered it, put it all together, uh, was to actually get get an even balance with it between the tracks, so that it um, so it wasn't it didn't sound patchy. So it was actually um, a pretty level um, sound overall, mm. um, which was um, quite an achievement considering, there's, as I say, there was a huge variety of um, standards in the um, masters. Mm. So the album has ten tracks, three of which I note have a, a Mark Wilkinson co-write. One of which is titled Roller Coaster, which missed the cut on Beethoven's Fist, which, as I've said to you before, is my favourite Lime Spiders album. What can you tell us about Roller Coaster? Well, um, if you listen to the lyrics, it's actually about, it's a story about um, coming across a woman who's working in a brothel like she's a prostitute mm. and... and um, and she was actually, but she was an actually, actually an ex, an ex partner of this guy, and he, mm. that, you know, like, um, so it's, um, that's the scenario about basically her being so fucked up that she couldn't even recognise him. Yeah, you know, mm. she sort of had a bit of a, bit of a handle on it, but didn't, um, yeah, that's so that's the storyline. But um, the the music in it's, uh, it's it's a powerful song and a great piece of music, you know. Okay, there's one called uh, Sweet Things, written by yourself and Stephen Waters. Uh, the liner notes state a classic pop gem. What's what's the story behind that one, mate? It's just a, um, it's just a, it's just a, um, a pop song. I'd, Steve came up with. I was working with Steve at the time. He came up with the music, and um, I put the lyrics to it. And um, it was just, um, as I say, I think it's a pop gem, and mm. um, you know, um, it. Um, gets away it's a lot of variety on this album actually it gets away from you know that unfortunately with, with there's been this perennial reputation of us being tagged as a, a punk band which is absolute nonsense mm. um because you make listen to this album any any of our recorded works and um it's obvious that um to any discerning ear that um well, actually, it's, it's great musicianship all the way to the bank, and um, yeah, a big variety of, of styles from pop to punk, to, or pop to hard edge rock and roll to you know psychedelia and everything in between, kind of thing. You know, um, you know that's the way I look at it, and people that do know our music realise that. You know, makes me want to ask: there was that compilation which came out uh, on Raven some years ago called Nine Miles High. Do you think that's a, that was a good representation? Uh, of the band, yeah, because I was heavily involved in okay. the, in the in the selection of the songs actually. Mm. Because okay. the story behind that is that um, I was living in Perth at the time, and I only received notification about that um, long after it was in production. And um, I eventually um, spoke to Graham Baker himself about my frustrations and and um, the fact that he was actually breaching copyright, etc. And I was just so insulted not to be even informed about it mm. by anybody. Um, so we turned things around, um, giving me his due. At least he was receptive to my frustrations and um, allowed me to. Um, I with the whole the entire track selection is uh, as handpicked by myself mm. and. The artwork as well. I organised the artwork for it, so it became a bit of a baby of mine. Actually, um, from it went from 
something that I had nothing to do with to having total control over mm, it. That's <laughs> good. It was a win. Yeah. Mick, over the and years... you've got to fight for your right to party. <laughs> <laughs> you do, you do. Mate, over the years, you've obviously written a large collection of songs. Um, did you have a songwriting process back in the day? Were you one of those writers who were constantly jotting down phrases? I mean, how did you go about the process of, of writing songs? Oh, I mean, I don't regard it as a process. It's like, um, it's all, I mean, I'm certainly not classically trained or anything. I'm, I've had very limited musical training. And um, so my technical knowledge of, I just knew enough chord progressions basically to, to get, you know, to, to pull a song together, mm. um, which is why I've never played on stage. But, but um yeah, I mean, let like, that to the experts. Although I did play guitar for the first four gigs ever. That's a bit of trivia, but I somehow struggled through the first four shows, singing and playing um, my rudimentary guitar, <laughs> which was a um, yeah a bit of a challenge. But um, I just learned enough chord progressions and got yeah, you know, just I guess had enough um, had a plethora of influences that. Um, took my ears in the right direction of sounds when I was looking, when I was fishing around, fiddling around with chords and mm. so on, and something sounded good, I'd add to it and went from there, you know, like um, sometimes the lyrics are written first, sometimes the music, but um, mainly, and sometimes even just the title, actually, in more okay. recent years, I've just, I base things around a title that, um, and then I go from there with the lyrics and then the, you know, as in the most recent song I've written, actually, coming up with a good, relevant title to the theme I had in mind and then going from there, you know. I guess sometimes the words would come easy and, and, and sometimes not. Absolutely, mm. yeah. Um, to the point, well, I mean, we've got some great examples of that. I mean, I remember my mother traction off one of the albums, um, I think it's off the uh, Botol album, it's off the second album. Mm. Um, that was a track that I had kicking around, and a few others like that, where I had kick, the music kicking around, that half-written lyrics, and Nine Miles High was another one, um, where they suddenly, well, I'd sort of reached a bit of a bit of a writer's block, and then it suddenly came to me at sort of bizarre times. I mean, in the case of Mother Traction, it was when I was going for a morning jog, mm. <laughs> and just all these uh, thoughts flooded my head, and I went home and wrote it all down, and another time was... Um, with, with Nine Miles High, it took me ages to get my head around that because it was such a really complex piece of music and um, a lot of lyrics and it's um, it's just intense and it's um, like it's just relentless. And um, I'd written the opening line and a couple of verses, I think, but I sort of didn't know where to go with it. And then it all sort of came to me in the back in the traveling in the van back from Melbourne one day um, uh, on a tour. So yeah, things suddenly just come to you, you know, when, you, when you've got them in the back of your mind, sometimes it sort of um, stays there, sometimes it comes back out. <laughs> <laughs> what about, um, there's a track here called Disposable World, an emotive song that resonates even more well, these that's days. another track, yeah, of course, I mean, that's another track they didn't make that was criminally left, left off from um, Haven's Fist, um, and it's definitely... <laughs> Definitely should have made it. It's a great song, and mm. it's my, it's my, it's my midnight oil song if you like. It's my big environmental song, and um, you know, it's just about you know, listen to the lyrics of that. If anybody does that anymore, <laughs> um, that's just uh, my environmental protest kind of gig, and um, a lot of um, touching on a lot of um, big issues there with that one. Well, we won't go through the whole album. I think it's. Uh, I think I'd rather fans uh, go out and, and buy it and explore it themselves. But there is one song there. You've got a breakup song called Larissa. Now, I note that's not the first time you'd penned a tune with a girl's name. The wonderful song Jessica from The Cave Comes Alive uh, comes to mind. Before we talk about Larissa, I've always loved the piano contained in Jessica, by the way. I think it worked so, so well in that song. Well, that's interesting you say that because we're actually... It's in our set. It's in our current set with... Um, mm. And, and our guitarist is actually the first time I've ever heard anyone do it. The um, the piano piece at the start of it that um, actually Tony Bennyback played, our bass player played, mm. recorded that out of interest. Our guitarist has emulated that with his guitar playing somehow. Mm. <laughs> like he's such a genius player, he's managed to um, 
get that theme into our intro of the song. So it sort of, um, it's got the works. <laughs> so what's the story behind Larissa? Just a, um, well, I mean, I mean, Jessica, I mean, that was a, that, that, that was a, actually the first song I'd ever written. Another bit of trivia. That was the first, first, the first song I'd ever written actually. Like, really? Um, so what goes yeah, back yeah. to like 79? I've written mean, it. Oh, I've written it long, long before I wow. formed the band, you know, okay. like I just had it hanging around, um, you know, and um, it was a fictitious, yeah, just a, the name fitted mm. nothing more to it than mm. that. But Larissa was a more personal, far, far more personal song about Lara, um, mm. Larissa as in Lara as in Larissa. Mm. And um, the lyrics are very close to my heart and um, that's in our set as well, actually. Um, that's become a, getting great feedback from that about that song off the album and um that's translates for a live and we we'll be playing it for the first time tomorrow night <laughs> so it's, that's pretty weird we rehearsed it last week for the first time it's the first time we've sung it since 93 <laughs> okay <Yeah. laughs> and so that was kind of it was kind of strange but it was reassuring to know that i can that my voice is um you know certainly still pulls it off and um it doesn't ch- sound any different, really. So my voice hasn't aged as such. You know, it still sounds. That's my tone's still my, my tone's still pretty rich, I guess. You know, w- wonderful to hear, wonderful to hear. Off the off the top of my head, did that line up from around two thousand and two with Murray Shepherd on drums? Did did they do any demos? Um, I, I think you're referring to two thousand and four, probably. Okay, sorry. Um, when we did that was when we promoted that live album. Yeah, actually, that was a tour we did to promote the live album. Oh, we did a show with the MC5, um, a one-off show at um, the Garlic Club in Sydney, um, supporting MC5 with their guest singers. We did that before that tour, but no, that that, that lineup never recorded okay. anything. Um, no, it's just uh, that lineup we just thrown together to um, support, to to um, promote that tour of uh, the live album. Great, great drummer, by the way. Just a powerhouse, Murray Shepherd. Now, in yeah, other news, and a great guy he is, and he's um, kicking around with uh, the Naked Lunch as well, who have uh, recent material out. They, they, and... they, they toured with us last year in December. Okay, how did those shows go? We did um, we did three shows with them. I mean, three out of the four of the tour, they didn't play Melbourne, but played up here and in Sydney, and that was great. You know, like um, worked really well. We. Yeah, I knew all the guys, apart from their singer, I knew the other guys really well from way back. And, mm. you know, it's a big mutual respect thing. And um, it's a good vibe playing with them. And, and Murray was obviously in the band at one, at one point. And um, the two Tonys, Tony Gibson, Tony Robertson, we go back a long way. And um, just a great um, bunch of musos, you know. Now, mate, you did mention a couple of gigs. There are a couple of gigs coming up this weekend. In fact, Friday the 23rd of October at the Kings Beach Tavern, and Saturday 24th at Burley Heads at, what's it called? Oh, it's uh, called Mo's, it's Mo's, called Mo's Desert. Desert Clubhouse. Okay. It's good to yeah, see I that mean, even with COVID restrictions, some venues are opening up again. Yeah, under duress. It's a okay. bit, it's, it's, it's uh, ongoing. I'm, I manage the band as well. So it's, um, I'm dealing with um, all the logistics of this and it's um, not easy. You know, it's, um, I've been on the receiving end of a fair bit of um, rubbish, actually, from venue, um, from people who run venues and so on. And um, it's just a real delicate balance. It's a real juggling act with, um, I mean, people are allowed to stand now, but they can't dance. I mean, how do you police that? And how are people not going to be able to dance to our music? Mm, <laughs> mm. Yeah, sure. It's just, absurd. it's just absurd, you know, really. I mean, what are they going to have? Um, if any, I can tell you this, right? And I mean, Letting the band and everyone else involved know if 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 any bounce if people start if people stand up and start moving about a bit and enjoying themselves for God's sake if bounces any bouncer steps in to stop that I will leave the stage I'll mm. just get off you know that'll mm. be the end of the gig if I see that happening so they should uh, <laughs> take notice of that I think there's a lot of paranoia about the um, COVID business and also um, the ticket. The ticketing, um, they've been selling by the table and things like that. So um, hopefully they're standalone ticketing now. So I haven't actually clarified that yet, but it's all 
that's part of the reason why it's so frustrating because it's um, changing by the day. You know? mm. Now, the uh, upcoming shows will also showcase a new lineup, relatively new lineup for the band featuring, you referenced him before, Ray Floyd Jones on guitar, who I believe uh, I read on a, a bit of a blurb that he's given you a, a new lease of life. In what way, Mick? Well, he played on that tour last year, and um, so he's been with me for about a year now. Right. Um, um, we've put up with each other for about a year now. <laughs> no, actually, we get along. We get along pretty well. And actually, he's a, just a genius guitarist. And it was just for an old association. I'd come by a Floyd, and um, it was just um, so it's kind of by chance, really, um, friend of a friend kind of thing. And um, first time he played, he just blew me away at rehearsal, and I just like from that from that point on, I just nothing changed. I mean, like. Um, you know, um, he's an absolute brilliant guitarist. I mean, anybody who's seen him knows what I'm talking about. Anyone who saw us play on those shows last year mm. knows what I mean. I mean, he really is one out of the box, you know. And uh, for me to be excited about, I mean, we're a guitar fan. I started with a brilliant guitarist in Richard Jacobison. And so for me, to be, for me to be this excited about a guitarist this far down the track, it's, you know, it stands mm. as testimony to his playing, you know. Mm. Mick, as you know, I am a student of Australian music history and I love digging into a musician's past. I do wish to mention a recent Facebook photo you recently posted. It's a great shot of you with uh, the great Ron Ashton from the Stooges at a dark carnival gig in Canberra circa 1992. Fond memories of that show, mate? I, I know I was, I was there at that one. It was, a, it, was a, it was a good evening of rock and roll. You were there, did you say? I was at that show, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, the Hitman played as well. I think we were the first band on, actually. We, we would have been the first band on. Yeah. So, pretty good line. It pretty was. good line-up. I mean, we were in our heyday, and we were on first. And, um, you know, great memories of that night, because um, I ended up back at um, Ron Ashton's motel room, and uh, he was, at, now, obviously late, and we'd, we'd um, had a few. and um, But he pulled his guitar out, and I just, I was just interested in those two just chords and, um, you know, how to, yeah, what they were, you know, mm, what mm. what they even looked like. And he didn't hesitate to grab his guitar and show me, you know, right. there and then, like, um, which cool. was just um, a pretty special moment yeah. and uh, a great guitar lesson. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's a good story. Actually, 1992 was a fairly decent year for the Spiders, wasn't it? There were the Black Crow uh, support slot as well for memory, which we've spoken about before. What about the um, the Iggy Pop shows in 89, Fun Times? Oh, of course, yeah. That was brilliant. We, we mm. met Iggy in, uh, in New York the previous year, and okay. um, and we established an instant rapport with him, and um, so we were both signed to versions. That's how, that's how I first got to find out about um, the band, and okay. um, it's just really genuinely really, really dug us. And, um, so it wasn't a matter of trying to prove ourselves. It was just like... One in all, in we just had a great time, and the Horton gig was fantastic. And mm. um, then we rocked up to Newcastle the following night, um, Newcastle OSL from memory. And um, yeah, they were both great gigs. And um, Iggy's um, just surprisingly down to earth, and you know, just a real, um, just a nice bloke, you know, mm. like um, he just loves his music and he's really approachable. And I found him, you know. When I first met him in New York, it just before. Well, we, I avoided talking about music. I didn't want to do. I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to, you know, go the obvious route. So we went. I'd read a profile in his private life that he spent a lot of time fishing in in the woods with his son Sean in um, fishing of all things in mm. in in, uh, in the woods of America and North America. And um, so my opening line to him um, back then was. Um, so he he like fishing uh, he like fishing Nicky you know this is after you know he's standing right opposite me and no one's saying a word and um, we were all shell shocked when they walked in or him and Jeremy Man walked in, into our dressing room together um, so of course we were just absolutely shell shocked and um, I was standing at the doorway and Nicky's standing right opposite me um, so he didn't walk past me so I think he must have known I was a singer or whatever but he didn't walk past me he just stood opposite me and it was like with this intense eyes of his, like, um, with with mascara, which made them 
which he <laughs> accentuated that. And um, <laughs> he looked his right at me, not saying anything. And my mind's ticking over big time. I'm thinking, don't blow this, Mick. You know, like, <laughs> um, this is a, you know, this is your chance to to chat to a and uh, to a bloody hero sort of thing. And sure. um, I yeah. went with the fishing angle. I, I my opening line was, um, so I hear like fishing Iggy, and he just went, "How do you know that, man?" Yeah, I said, and I said, I remember it verbatim. I remember it clearly. I said, because I'm a fan of you as a as a person. Um, I, I just simply said, I'm a fan of you as a person. Mm. And with that, he picked me up. He just he didn't hesitate. He fucking picked me up off the ground and looked at me and went, "I knew you'd be a dude." <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so, that was the highlight of my rock and roll career. <laughs> so stories like that, Mick, are are in your book, I assume. Yeah, yeah, that's, okay. it's hard to relate to stories like that in in black and white, but yeah. um, I did. Of course, I mentioned to it because that was a big night all around because Faith Faith No More had just played in, before us, mm. um, the original Faith No More. So I was I was all a bit overwhelming to say the least. <laughs> so it was, um, yeah, certainly um, a very special night. In in and it was a college music showcase seminar gig at. Um, so I had a lot of no, the album. Our album was number one on the on the college charts at the time. The mm-hmm. K comes alive. So it was a very profile key, to say the least. You know. I just mentioned your book. There is uh, is there an update on how that's progressing? Well, this year it's taken a bit of a backseat to other things. Mm. I sort of had a break from it for a while. Sure. Um, and it's actually probably been a good thing because I've had time to get some more editing done on it and just polish it up a bit and um I've now got a woman involved who's um a woman called Claire Halliday. She's in Melbourne and she's a pretty known writer herself, mm. like an actual, you know, paid writer. Mm. Um she's written for the age and published a few books of her own and um really sought after writer actually, like and she does it for a living and uh, so she's now on board with helping me out with it. So I've got to get back to actually finishing it now. Like it's I'm, I'm sort of started the 19th chapter, which was based around the bizarre of the tour we did in December last year. It's based around the um, many um, interesting events that occurred on that. There's enough content to um, for another chapter. And then I only thought recently, like the tw- there's got to be a 20th chapter, and it's simply going to be called 2020, we, like incorporating these shows and sure. the um, recent developments of the band. With this year and um, the whole COVID thing, and I think so. The twentieth chapter is going to be called twenty twenty. So there you go. Uh, hopefully, a... hopefully the, the new the numerology is going to work for me. <laughs> that's a, that's that actually ties in nicely, doesn't it? To complete it, twenty twenty twentieth chapter with the release of the album as well. Well, I just thought it had to be done. I think that's a great title for that last chapter. Um, and just leave it at that. I mean, the 20th chapter, 2020, I mean, that's a good sort of full stop, you know, at the end of the uh, book, you know. Totally agree, mate. I um, we, we chatted extensively over your career, looked over your career a couple of years back, but I have got a few other random questions which I'm just going to hit you with uh, before we finish up today. I, I do recall you did backup vocals on uh, She Got No Love by the Dubrovniks from the amazing Audio Sonic Love Affair record, which such a wonderful album. What are your recollections of, of that time oh, period? Oh, I've that... forgotten that myself. <laughs> yeah, was, I, was I credited with the back of you, you, you are. You are. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. I'd completely forgotten that. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> such a such a, a great rock album, that one. But, um, see, Grant Armstrong was in the Dubrovniks, and he's the guy that just did the connection there. Is he just He's the guy I'm talking about who just yep. compiled and mixed a new album yep. at his home studio. So... That's, uh, he was in the Dubrovniks and still runs their Facebook page, and you know, um, so that's the connection it's there. A nice time. You know, I knew Actually, all the I, guys, but um, I found some footage of Chris Flynn doing. doing uh, he does an acoustic type version of "Slave Girl" in Greece, which is online and worth checking out. If you haven't seen it, it's good gosh. stuff. Acoustic version, yeah, well, acoustic, song? acoustic-ish. <laughs> you know, acoustic type <laughs> version. There's a drummer there, but uh, check it out if you if you have time. Mate, as many yeah, fans, well, I mean, I, 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 I'm jammed with um, Chris all over the years, and yeah. um, we go back a long way. You great, know, and, um, great, great, great. I know, man. I knew all those guys from way back. You know, Boris and the boys. You know, yeah. they were just a good um, true believers, and you know the real, you know the real business, the real yeah. deal. You know, yeah. Great. Unfortunately, there's not much of it left. 
<laughs> Mate, but as many as many fans of the band would be aware, Slave Girl was covered by the Goo Goo Dolls some time back. There's footage of them online circa 2008 performing performing that song at the big Red Rocks Amphitheatre. Um, That's right, yeah. Must make it you feel special. Really, um, must make you feel special I've got, to see that. Oh, of course. I mean, um, that was a real honour and um, it made me a lot of money as well. <laughs> but um, they, um, they released... Uh, Best of Volume Two around that time, and um, with a with a DVD of that um, performance. So I've got it on disc as well. Um, and they used three guitars to, to to when they did Slave Girl Live. They used three guitars. Mm. Like um, we only needed, we only needed one. <laughs> but now they um, they come out um, to Sydney in '96 and did a showcase um, at the time. The Iris was a big hit, and they did it. They were the um, they um, they did a showcase music industry gig at the um, Cuba in Paddington, and um, I was a special guest at that, and uh, met them all. They just played about four songs, including Iris, that that um, off, off that album, Boy Named Goo, and um, I met them afterwards, and I took them along a um, I just as a thank you and a gift, I sort of thank you gift. I took them along a um bunch of um, all the all, all, all Lime Spiders 7-inch singles and couple, I think all the albums as well. I got them a big bag of Spiders nice. stuff mm. and um, and spent all this time talking to them just after they played and to the point where all the industry heads were... I just had my head saved as well for the first time ever, so people who didn't know me wouldn't have recognised me. Mm. And um, half of, So there was all these industry um, knobheads, um, you know, wanting to smooth, you know, Chuggy and all these cats wanting to smooth to him, of course, and um, and here's me commanding their attention. So <laughs> I was like looking over their shoulder going, well, who, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> so that was that in itself was really satisfying. And I genuinely, genuinely love the band and they um, just great guys. And, um, you know, I was just lucky enough to have a song on that very successful album of theirs. <laughs> Makes me want to ask when when Slave Girl was being written, were you aware that you had something special on your hands? Oh, of course, yeah. I well, not when it was being written, when it was finished. When mm. it, I mean, from the start, I knew there was. I mean, it occupies a whole chapter in the book, by the way. Like um, the whole story of how it was written and how it came together and how it was recorded, etc. And beyond that, you know, the, the longevity of it. And, you know, of the um, you know, the amount of success it's had, um, and featured in ABC two ABC TV docos and so on as well. Like um, a lot of things that people really probably don't know about it. And the biggest selling independent Australian single of all time, I mm. might add, that mm. was in the charts for over three years. But like the ironic thing, oh, I don't know, it's, I don't know if ironic is the right word, but um. The amazing thing is that um, three record labels in Sydney, the three, um, I thought the three coolest labels at the time, I approached them with it um, and they knocked it back. So I got knocked back by Hot Records, Waterfront and Phantom mm. before before Citadel picked it up. Did you know that? I did. I did. We, we discussed that and I, I have, I have well, read I, it I still, It's I, amazing. I still find that... I still find that it is. It's like a laughable. It really is. It is. It's like, I mean, what 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 didn't they like about it? You know. Sure. <laughs> like, you know? In two thousand and eight, you cut an EP called Revolution Blues under the Blood Group name. Came out on Off the Hip for memory. More people need to hear that. I, I think Spencer Jones plays guitar on the title track, doesn't he? Yeah, he plays on the, he plays right on the outro and okay. um, there's five tracks and um, I think it was. I'm not sure if it was 2008, but it was around there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, no, no. Um, I know when it was because it was something I did for my 45th birthday. So it was earlier than that. It was a couple of years earlier than that. Because mm-hmm. um, it was a project. It was this project. Um, I'd always, as a writer and someone who spent a lot of time in the studio with um, people spending too much time on overproducing songs, that simple songs I've written and so on. I got frustrated with the process over the years. And um, so this this is all about, I did it for my 45th birthday. Mm. Oh, yeah. Well, the rules of engagement were simply um, 
something that I always wanted to do just to um, prove to myself or anybody who was interested that um, songs can be written and recorded very quickly. Um, so, so I've written at rehearsal on a, we had one rehearsal on a Friday night where we hadn't been, we hadn't been played together before as a group this bunch. And they all knew each other, these Melbourne boys, but um, so I handpicked um, friends of mine from Melbourne who were great players mm. and um, we actually wrote the songs just jamming on a Friday night and come up with about eight ideas and um, recorded the next day and mixed them the next day. So it was all done in three days. So that, that was um, that was a challenge and we, um, you know, that's, that's the story behind it. And there were, uh, we um, ended up with five songs that were more than good enough to release and there was probably there was a couple of others that were contenders as well. So it was a pretty productive weekend. It's good. It's There's some good tunes on it, but... I encourage all, uh, all all fans of of the Lime Spiders and Australian music to check it out, mate. Uh, good to catch up. The new record yeah, is out and about. Thanks, You're welcome. The new record is out and about, and it's called uh, Delirium. You're uh, bringing some sunshine to uh, rock and roll fans in a, a fairly miserable 2020, mate. As always, good. Oh, to... well, that's it. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, that's what I'm looking forward to playing. I mean, mm. for God's sake. I mean, it doesn't really matter if it, if there isn't many people there. The people are there are going to love it because the band's really cooking, and um, it's a matter of just um, giving people a bit of body positivity, fun and, and, some positivity, and yeah. uh, rock and, and you know, high energy rock and roll, and um, you know, have them you know, getting away from all this bullshit for a couple of hours at least. You know, well, it is great that the uh, the spiders are still very much a going concern for you. The legacy continues. It's a it's a wonderful thing. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it.